Today we're going to be talking about an art piece that is so famous, it's actually known as one of the best art pieces of its century. It has hung on the walls of the Louvre since its opening over 200 years ago. It has also become an emblem of an entire art movement. First commissioned by the King of France as a way to invoke civic pride in his people, it turned on his heels and actually became a symbol of the French Revolution. I'm talking about the 10 by 13 foot piece called Oath of the Herati by Jacques-Louis David, done in the year 1784. This piece is so incredible. There's so much history that revolves around the piece and it's so fun to analyze. So let's go ahead and dive in. But first, if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the bell icon off to the side so you can get notified of when I post new videos each week. So the painting is based off of Roman legend, and the story goes like this. There was a conflict between the Romans and another group called the Alba Longa. Now instead of going off to war and having many people suffer and die, they decided to resolve this conflict through a duel. The rules were set. Each side of the conflict needed to find a set of triplets that they could send to duel one another. On the Roman side, they sent the Herati brothers, and on the Alba Longa side, they sent the Curiati brothers. They met during a battle, and immediately, the two Herati brothers were killed, and the third fled. Eventually, though, he came back. Don't worry. And when he came back, he defeated the three Curiati brothers. Now, there is a twist to this story. The sister of the Herati brothers was actually engaged to the enemy, to one of the brothers of the Curiati. So when her brother returned home safely, she knew that her fiancé had died. And in a pile of sadness and grief, she began to mourn the loss of love. Now, to combat that, the brother, who was very upset by this show of grief, decided the only righteous civic act would be to kill his sister, which he does. While he kills her, he says, and I quote, so perish any Roman woman who mourns the enemy. Yeah, lots of issues with that, but let's continue on. He was eventually put on trial for killing his sister, but he gets off. Now, the moment we see in this piece is the moment right before the battle, when the father of the three brothers calls his sons to him in the show of civic pride and virtue and asks them, will you sacrifice your lives for our country and for what you believe in. And it's this moment of oath saying, yes, we will, because this is what duty looks like. Jacques-Louis David says of this moment, the moment which must have preceded the battle when the elder gathering his sons in their family home makes them swear to conquer or die. And that's what we see. You can even see the woman weeping off to the side as the sister realizes she's either going to lose a brother or a lover. So why paint this story? It seems a little complicated, especially because it revolves around death and loss of love and grief and heroism and civic virtue. Well, this begins the neoclassical art style led by Jacques-Louis David. They decided, let's look back to the Greeks. They had it pretty good, so what can we do that they had? And one of the things the Greeks really, really honored was civic virtue and honor and pride and becoming part of your nation and your community. And so that was one of the major drives for this art piece. If you want to learn more about the neoclassical art time period, check out my video that I did that kind of gives a brief overview of that. Now, what's super interesting about this piece is the actual history of the painting. Like I mentioned previously, it was originally commissioned by French King Louis XVI. He's the guy that lived in Versailles. He's the guy that spent all the money. And he's the guy that actually gets beheaded during the French Revolution. So he starts commissioning this piece. Perhaps it was because he wanted to instill in his subjects this idea of having pride, of being French, of becoming a part of your community, of voting, and just, you know, being civic, you know, being virtuous. 
But this didn't last long, because five short years later, the French Revolution begins, King Louis gets beheaded, as does his wife Marie Antoinette, and, you know, the French Revolution happens. So this piece actually shifts history, where it was once commissioned by the king to represent one thing, now it represents revolution, and are you willing to die for your rights? And it becomes this piece of propaganda. Jacques-Louis David actually is a pretty clever man because his role also shifts. Once employed by the king, now he's employed by the state, and he becomes the lead propagandist for the French Revolution in terms of painting. He becomes a large voice in the conversation, and this largely helps him start and continue forward this neoclassical movement. It's with this painting. So let's go ahead and do an analysis on this piece. How did this piece become such a big deal? Well, a lot of it has to do in how it was created. Let's dive in. So looking in the background, first, it does not catch our eye at all. It's very simple, it's very plain, but it's very important. It's really shallow, and yet there's a lot of depth to this. That's because this is based on this very dramatic story and it almost feels like we're in a theatrical setting. It almost looks as if the characters are on a stage and the background is simple so that we're focusing on these characters. But I want you to look at this background. The structure, the architecture is very Roman in style. Again, we're going back to this classical time period. So we've got arches, we have uh, Doric columns, that kind of match with the Etruscan columns. And in the background, you can see there is some depth back there. There are barrel vaultings, all of these brick laying. These are all parts of Roman architecture. So we're set in a classical setting. But again, it's really simple so that your attention isn't drawn to it necessarily, but your focus is more on the characters. The other thing I wanna point out before we get to those characters is the lighting of this scene. It's quite simple, yet very dramatic at the same time. We've got really intense diagonals that are created through our light source. So it gives us this black backdrop and it almost spotlights our characters in the front. The other thing it does is it becomes darker in that top left hand corner and slides down so that the light kind of follows this pyramid scheme, which is really heavily based on the Renaissance construction. So while yeah the background and the lighting isn't something that is necessarily going to catch your eye, what it does is it leads your eyes to the most important part of the piece, which are the characters who tell this story. But it also sets the stage. We know we're in Rome right now. Our background has very very subtle earth tones, again to make it look like an actual Roman ruin or building. And then our figures are dressed in a little bit brighter, but not so bright earth tones. But I do want you to notice that all of the characters have similar colors on, and that's to give this piece a sense of balance. Could easily be thrown off balance because of how we have, you know, heavy male figures standing on the left and light female figures sitting on the right. The colors help to balance. So you see one of the brothers wearing red, the father wearing red, and the sister wearing red. And that gives us this balance to this piece so that we don't feel like we're tipping over. Now when you look at this piece, especially in comparison to a Rococo piece, the lines and the brush strokes are very tight and very controlled. Our Rococo had looser brush strokes that gave it this frothy frilliness to it. Neoclassical does the absolute opposite and tightens up those strokes. It makes it more focused, more severe, and it looks more like the classical art from the High Renaissance and the Greek and Roman time period. It makes it feel more realistic, especially as you look at the anatomy of the figures. I don't know about you, but I'm drawn to the legs, perhaps because they're not clothed and it's easy to see. But just check out the anatomy that is on those legs. You can see individual bones and muscles of the knees and the kneecaps. You can see the strained, tense veins of the calves as they're, they have adrenaline and blood rushing through them. 
it's incredibly realistic. Look at his toes. It feels Caravaggio-esque as you've got color that doesn't really match on their toes. You have red toes uh, set against the paleness of the skin. It just feels real. It feels like a photograph instead of a painting. And that happens because of those tight brush strokes that David uses. Let's finally talk about these uh, diagonal lines. We already mentioned the diagonal lines of the light, but I want you to see the diagonal lines that are created because of the structure of the figures. We do have a lot of pyramid composition here, and I'm going to point out a couple. The first one is going to start as more of an isosceles pier or triangle where we've got the tall men standing on the left and a strong diagonal line that points us to the women. This helps us read the piece from left to right, starting with the most important part, which are these three brothers that are giving an oath to their father to fight for country, right? And then it takes us to the weaker side, the women who are mourning loss and grief, and that and we'll talk about that in a second. But there's also a pyramid structure between the father and the sons. You can see the sons are raising their hands towards their father who raises his hands towards the sky and gives us that nice pyramid there. Also, their legs add dramatic diagonal lines and create more intersections that give us this dramatic feel to it, but it also feels very tense. It feels like this moment right before battle, which is exactly what we're looking at here. Now, let's compare and contrast these figures. We've got the father who's in the center, which at the time would make a lot of sense. He's the head of the family. He's in the center. He's the center of your attention. He's the one that holds the weapons. He's kind of controlling this scene, right? Off to the left, we've got the three brothers who clearly show their devotion to father and country as they are willing to sacrifice their lives for that. They're dressed in battle clothing, ready to go, ready to fight. You can see their arms are around each other. They're bonded together. They're in this together. And then on contrasting that, you've got the women kind of sitting off to the side. They do not look strong. If you look at their flesh compared to their brothers, it's a lot softer and smoother and perhaps a little bit weaker. They are prone to feel emotion and you can see that. You can see the children in the background who look worried. But it's this idea of who are we going to lose and let's grieve that loss. So there is a lot of deep meaning in this piece and a lot of it has to do with this intellectual side to it. There is so much you can read into this. First of all, reading into it as, you know, French King Louis looking at this and saying, this is what I want my people to be to me. I'm the king. I want them to be bonded together in an oath to me. But then on the flip side, what this piece means for revolution, right? This is a piece that's bringing people together to fight and lose their lives for what they believe is valuable. So you can see how that shifts in one piece using the same story, which I think is incredible. But there's more to this. You can see a difference between masculinity versus femininity. Who is the perfect man? Who is the perfect woman? You can see their ideals being depicted here. You can see war versus family, especially in the story of Camilla, the sister who loses all of it, right? And what's more important? And what did the Romans think? What did the French think? And what do you think? We can see a lot of gender roles here. The men are going to do the action while the women are more passive. The men are showing bravery and the women fear. There's a lot of roles that you can read into this that reflect the time period, but also help us to reflect on our current situation and see if any of these have changed or have remained the same. It's really interesting to look at. So this piece, again, becomes one of the most famous pieces during the 1700s. It becomes the symbol of freedom, of fighting, of virtue, of honor, and it hangs on the wall of the Louvre. It becomes a symbol of revolution, a sign of changing times, a sign of family, of loss, of war, of grief, of patriotism. 
It becomes the emblem of the neoclassical art movement. And it's a good reminder for us today. What do we value? What do we support? Who do we give our oaths to? But I think essentially the most important part of this piece is to show how meaning can change over time. How one person can intend a piece of art to mean one thing, but based on the audience's interpretation, it's going to shift. And that's the magic of art. It's the magic of history. Things are going to change, and that's great. That's what an artist wants. They want their art to last over centuries, over generations. So what does this piece mean to you? I'd like to hear your thoughts and comments below. If you found this video helpful, intriguing, entertaining, educational, if you just liked it, make sure you hit the like button. And if you haven't yet subscribed, don't forget to do that. Please comment below on any thoughts or questions that you have. I'd be happy to answer them for you. And uh, see you next time where the art just keeps getting better.